Ole, ready. Right. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to yet another session of the African Epistemologies Advanced Seminar Series. My name is Olarato Mukumuzi, and I'm a philosopher and doctoral fellow at the uh, Institute of Humanities in Africa. On behalf of Dr. Divine Fa and the convener of the, co of the seminar series, Dr. Sanya Osha, we welcome you and thank you for joining us from your whatever part of the world you're in. Um, before continuing, please make sure that you, if you are in the Zoom room, uh, to rename yourself, include your name and surname to avoid being kicked out of the meeting by colleagues. Uh, this is a security measure to ensure that there is no Zoom bombing that occurs during the session. In addition, please note that the seminar is being recorded and live streamed and all participants tacitly consent by remaining in the seminar. Uh, at HUMA, we organize several seminar series, which may be of interest to you, including the Publishing Africa Seminar Series, Attire Seminar Series, the Ethical uh, humanitarian, Humanitarianism Series, the Doctoral Seminar Series, and the Book Launch Seminar. You can retrieve all the seminar details on our website at www.huma.uct.ac.za. For today's African Epistemologies Advanced Seminar Series, we are joined by Darian Pollock, a PhD candidate in philosophy at Harvard University. As a philosopher, he specializes in social ontology, critical theory, ethics, and the philosophy of race. He is set to serve as a graduate fellow at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. He also is a founder of the Street Philosophy Institute, a Massachusetts-based think tank aimed at promoting research in public philosophy and civic engagement. Today, Darian will share with us his philosophical conception of street knowledge. Darian, uh, we welcome you today here at HUMA. Uh, so yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, pulling up my notes, so one second, I'm a millennial. Can, we, can everyone hear me? This is like a thumbs up if you can hear me good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first, I just want to start, you know, by just reintroduce myself. My name is Darren Pollock, um, PhD student at, at Harvard um, in, philosophy, in the philosophy department. Um, and before I just dive into the talk, I just want to, you know, give a couple of shout outs, um, especially to uh, Professor Sonia Osha, who I met at um, uh, the third biennial World African Philosophy Conference in Tanzania a couple years back. We we clicked. We we had really great philosophical discussions. So I'm just delighted to be invited um, personally by him. Um, but I also want to shout out a lot of my um, mentors and comrades on the continent who have done their best to kind of incorporate me into the African philosophy scene. And I'm thinking about people like Professor Barry Howland, um, Professor um, Edwin Etiabo. Um, Professor D.A. Masolo in Kenya, Professor Humtunji, um, and since I'm in South Africa, I have to definitely mention uh, Professor Ramose. Um, these are people who have done their best to kind of put me into the information channels of African philosophy. And I think that there's a lot more work to be done to connect um, the continent to all diasporic aspects of, of philosophy um, when it comes to Black peoples and, and um, Black, um, peoples of African descent. Uh, apologies, it seems like Darren's video is frozen. Darren? Uh, let's just give him a second, sorry. Apologies, uh, this is typically what happens during a Zoom meeting. Um, Darren, can you hear us? I can hear you, something happened. I don't know if it was on my end or something. No worries about that. Um, you, yeah, okay. Uh, can continue. 
Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so so what I was saying, so the, the ordinary language perspective that I, that I have in mind is, 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 is can be articulated in such in such a way. In media, in in different aspects of, of ordinary life, there's this intuition, this concept that people have. And, and in, in English language, I often hear it um, packaged as street smarts or somebody is street smart. Um, and so I, I think that that's that's what I mean by starting from the ordinary language intuitions. Like, what are people picking up when they use this locution? What is going on? And there's a second order question about what, what are we missing in our epistemic frameworks, rather than Africa or Europe, where we don't have any kind of contact with the ordinary intuition of this thing that they, we put together called street, this adjective street, and this thing smart, which can be articulated in a lot of different ways. So there's a thing about this talk is like it's going to be an ordinary language intuition. But what I want to do is I want to do what we should do in philosophy is I want to formalize it a bit. I want to give some kind of formal grounding so we can have clear discourse about what people on the street call street smarts. So I've already started that formalization by kind of taking the smart out of it, making a more precise word. I say, okay, street knowledge. So in some ways, when people talk about the smarts, they're talking about some kind of information or expertise that is going on outside of kind of, okay, so now we're going to get into it. This is where the philosophy starts. What, what are we talking about? Okay. So <coughs> what, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. I want to start by, I think all good philosophy starts with the history of philosophy. I'm a Western philosopher. I'm not going to say that. I'm very interested in African philosophy, but that's not my training. So part of, you know, the audience here is going to be like, okay, well, then what, how is this going to, you know, scale up? But I want to start somewhere. We, we need a place to, you know, sink our teeth in. And so I think that um, when I talk about the history of philosophy, I'm going to focus on the history of Western philosophy. So within the history of Western philosophy, we can definitely say that we have um, uh, um, cases in which philosophers, mainstream philosophers, uh, philosophers uh, established philosophers that we see a part of the Western canon have tried to do what this, this thing that I call typecasting knowledge. And so what I just mean by that is like anything, you know, you can typecast anything. So if you typecast anything and anything is X, then you can feel that X to make it X be knowledge. So um, if I typecast cats, I can typecast knowledge. So um, within the history of Russian philosophy, I needed a starting point. I really could have maybe started with Socrates, you know, he was a skeptic. So <laughs> that gives you this first starting part of like not, you know, I don't know if I can know anything, but if you want like a positive account of knowledge, I, I think one of the most firm accounts that we have in the history of Western philosophy is, is what Kant calls in the critique of pure reason, a priori knowledge. Okay, so this is knowledge that, you know, you can arrive at without any kind of experience. Uh, that's questionable. And there's other philosophers I have in mind, people like Quine and other people, even pragmatists like William James, who straightforward um, just deny that a priori knowledge is a thing. And, and, and also, I want to say it's not even just, um, so it's not, you know, you get, you always obviously get the critique from African philosophers and people outside of Western philosophy, but within the, in the Western canon, there are so many philosophers who, dis, analytic philosophers who disagree with the whole phenomenon of a prior knowledge. I think of people like Saul Kripke, Quine, Hillary, Hillary Putnam, so there's, there's names out there. So a prior knowledge is, is what it is, and then you have this whole thing of called practical knowledge. Now, practical knowledge itself is a whole big bag, right? I'm attributing practical knowledge to a certain tradition, which is the tradition is called American pragmatism. And I attribute that tradition with, with thinkers like William James, George Santayana, John Dewey, and, and others. Um, but so particularly William James and his he has lectures on pragmatism where he gives a, one of the most straightforward accounts about practical knowledge that I think there is. And so practical knowledge, if you just want like a, a roundabout way of thinking about it, is knowledge that is tied to um, reasons of action. So if you think about theoretical knowledge or whatever as something that's like about beliefs or some kind of mental stuff, the practical knowledge is going to be some kind of action stuff. Um, in analytic philosophy, they call it buying, like doing something. And so um, for someone to have practical knowledge, 
and, and on this kind of view is for them to have knowledge based on what to what to do. Okay. Um, so and then so you know obviously you have scientific knowledge. That scientific knowledge obviously is a general thing, but um, in terms of analyzing it, I think I attribute that to um, to Kuhn, um, in Structure of the Scientific Revolution. He he gives uh, an account of what goes into the process of constituting what we call scientific knowledge. And so I say I I, I see him as you know trying to say okay scientific knowledge isn't straight as straightforward it is but it is a thing, and so that's the case. And last but not least. <clears throat> we have um, this phenomenon called common knowledge, which is was first, I think, uh, analyzed in a, in a small little book called Convention um, by a philosopher at Princeton called um, by the name of David Lewis. And basically, common knowledge is a very interesting phenomenon. It, it's, um, it, it's often articulated as we know that you know that we know. So there's uh, what Lewis thinks is that there's certain certain propositions among a speaker community, so people who share a certain kind of language games, to use Wittgenstein's term, that in order to be a part, to be a member of this, 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 this social thing, language thing, you have to, it's certain propositions that you have to be aware that other people are aware of and they're aware of. And so that's the kind of common ground that you have. So we have all these analytical uh, items of knowledge and so what I think, what I, the reason I went through this is because I think that sets us up good to talk about the possibility of this thing that I call street knowledge. So I just want to get, I just want to kind of massage the intuition that we, that this might be a thing, okay? <clears throat> so before we talk about street knowledge though, we have to do some kind of what people call conceptual engineering work. This is why that's important. I've, I've talked about streets, the streets and street philosophy. This is, that's a whole nother program that I'm not gonna talk about now, but I've, I've talked about this for now, maybe about six years now. Um, everywhere I go with, I'm talking philosophers or economists. I was just talking to law school people about it at Harvard Law. Um, there's this kind of problem, of, I call it like a problem of connotation. So the problem of connotation kind of maybe thought about like this, there's, this term, the streets, that has been tied so heavily to certain kind of media um, uh, um, uh, representations. And those media representations are so heavily racialized, especially the Americans. And so it, they're concretized in particular kinds of ways. So when you use the term streets, even just by itself or as an adjective to accent something about philosophy or knowledge, people have this kind of pushback and like, hold up. Are you just talking about people who are poor or deviant or ghetto or, and that is exactly what I don't want to talk about. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to de-racialize the streets, de-mediaize the streets. So I have images of, you know, this is an image from a famous American um, uh, series called The Wire, um, where it talks about a, 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 a ghetto culture in, in, in Baltimore, it's drug dealing, things like that. You have a famous movie, Paid in Full, um, which is the similar things, and a movie down here called American Meat, which is about the Latino uh, version of, of, of the same kind of thing. So what I, what I want to do just straightforwardly is I want to de-racialize de the streets in conversation by um, charging everyone that's called to bracket, you know, let's do some hermeneutics here. I mean, not hermeneutics, some, some, um, uh, some Herzlian, um bracketing, all right? where we, we, we take um, this concept of streets and we try, to we try to suspend all of the connotations, all the associations that we have inherited about this term to the media. Why do we wanna do this? The reason why we wanna do this is because once we clear that up, clear those associations, then we can have, so clear the associations, clear the connotations, then we can have clear denotation, clear reference, about what the term streets can mean once we use it in our theory. So I'm gonna say that again. We clean up the, the associations. The associations is just a psychological word for connotation. Connotation is what philosophers of language talk about in linguists. We clean that up because that's coming from the world. And we go into our laboratory and we say, hey, okay, what can this word do or be without all of those connotations? Once we have that, we can get to a reference point, what philosophers of language call denotation. 
Okay, so there's a clear path we're trying to go to. And I think once we do that, you're going to see that this, this term has a lot of explanatory power. Even for African philosophy and vis-a-vis -vis Western philosophy, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so this is just another way of going through it. So these are, the, if you want to just list the so, just possible associations or connotations, okay, what the streets is not. The streets is not or not equivalent to, if you want to be a logician about it, ghetto communities. So I'm not using it in that sense. Minority communities not using in that sense. Dysfunctional communities not using in that sense. Impoverished communities not using in that sense. Developing a third world community is not using that sense. And so for a criminal, not using that sense. Now, let's see if we can walk a true government at the same time. In q and I do want to return to some of these things. And I, I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about the proxiness that a person or a group may have by being underclass to the street knowledge. But we're not going to get there yet. But I, so right now, just totally suspended. But I do want to kind of uh, give a preview, like hmm, maybe we do need to, okay. But right now we're going to so we're going to we're going to suspend it. Okay. So when I talk about the streets, in your mind, take these associations out. So what are the streets? Let's give a definition. We got to give definitions. I'm an analytic philosopher. We're going to give definitions. Only for the sake of being clear. We could disagree later on, but we're going to keep going. So what are the streets? I define the streets as marginal speaker communities that obtain in relation or in opposition to the status quo of a particular social arrangement. <clears throat> okay, some people may say, okay, that's pretty clear, right? I actually don't think it's clear enough which is why I want to unpack the one of the most important terms in this definition um, that I'm using as a primitive term, as a basic term, but I think it needs more unpacking to kind of get to the point of the matter about what the streets are. And that term is the term of the status quo. What do I mean by the status quo? I'm sure people are wondering like, what does he mean by the status quo? Um, I want to say this as a side mark. One of my problems with critical theory is that people, and, and a lot of just, um, uh, explanations about alienation and, uh, and, and oppression. One of my problems with that, that kind of literature is that it treats terms like status quo as primitive. Like they, they don't need explaining. Like I can just walk around talking about the status quo and people don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, that's not the case. And I think that's why we have problems in critical, critical theory because you get into discussions and people are just talking past each other because they're not working with the same definition. So let's clear up the definition so we can have the same conversation. That's my point about analytic philosophy. And by the way, white people did not invent analysis. This is my, I, I champion this idea. I will not, I refuse to, to cede analysis to the white supremacist power structure. That to me is what I also call white minded. Okay, so we're gonna, it's a lot of words I know, but we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna make some progress. All right, so the streets are, is just this, but what is this, you know, what is the status quo? So. If you're, if you're a critical theorist or if you're a person that's in the history of philosophy, you, you would probably say, I heard this word before. Well, you probably heard it first in Marx and then maybe, you know, Marx in a communist manifesto he talks about a little bit. And then also Gramsci's, uh, Antonio Gramsci who's an Italian philosopher for people who don't know and his prison notebooks. Um, I, I thought about pulling some stuff out, but I'm, I, I don't think I wanna do that because I don't wanna, I want, there's no part in Gramsci and Marx yet that I found that they gave the right kind of clarity to the status quo. They kind of treat like a permanent. So what I want to do is kind of give like a definitional, and if, if anybody knows different, let me know. But right now I, ha I have yet to find, I've been combing to, through the text, I haven't found any clear articulation. So my, the, my defini sta definition of the status quo is this. The status quo is, or are speaker communities that determine what kind of information is considered acceptable legitimate or significant in a social arrangement. Now, you, I, I, I want people to understand, it's like, look, when I, I'm using the term social arrangement here on purpose, because a lot of times, in, in especially in critical theory circles, we, we go macro immediately. Oh, he's talking about racial groups and gender you know, roles. But look, I'm talking about the social world. So the social world has a lot of different variations. So, Social arrangement could be something like a racial group or something like, you know, whatever geographical group or whatever, but it also could be as simple as 
a, a lunchroom in high school. I think I think lunchroom lunchrooms in high schools or high schools in general, they have status quo. They have the cool people. They have the people that aren't so cool, who are not part of status. So why am I why am I kind of you know making this you know a little funny? The reason why is because I think it's important for any kind of if you develop a social theory and that explanation can't scale up or scale down. So if I can't explain just as much about the lunchroom case as I can the race case, it, there's something missing about my explanation because the social world has to be one thing in order for sociality to be a thing. So that's what I'm, I, I want people to do. So don't just focus on the macro cases. Focus on something as simple as your family reunion. I don't know if y'all have family reunions, but we do. There's a status quo at every family reunion. There's, a, there's those, 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 those relatives that aren't so in with the with the media, you know, with the name. So that's what I'm trying to get at, right? Um, am I good on time? Okay. Um, so yeah. So the analysis of the status quo. So I do social ontology, so I'm a talk in the language of properties, substance properties. I'm that kind of dude. I'm really that. Um, properties of the status quo. So the first, the status quo is for me is constituted by a single, single meaning hegemonic or a set, so more than one, you know, one plus N, of competing speaker communities that hold a power relation over other subordinate speaker communities that, comp that comprise the social arrangement. So that, that's a lot. And I have a diagram, I have an a image that kind of can clear that up. But I want to, the reason why I'm, I'm hedging myself here is because there's, there's a whole nother talk and I could do a, a just as much talk on the concept of the status quo as I'm going to do on the streets. And the reason why is because there's a kind of in-group, out-group thing even going on within the status quo. So if you think about the status quo as like these institutions that's running shit, well, hey, they're not agreeing with, with, with each other either. They're contesting each, each other, you know? Um, that is just a, a point about contestation. Like the status quo itself is always trying to fight about what's going to happen. Now, it does come the case where cert in certain situations and certain social arrangements, one institution or speaker group becomes dominant even within the status quo. That's what we call hegemony. It's become hegemonic within that status quo. So the power has kind of lifted up. And I, I think that's important, but I, I kind of want to table that because that itself is the status quo is very interesting, when you, especially when you bring in the psychological language of in-group, out-group. Right. Just because we're part of the same status quo don't mean I see you part of my group. That's a different psychological layer. OK, so so what kind of power relation is it? The power relations can look a lot of different ways. They can be material. They can be physical. They can be this and that. I think the power relation is what I call discursive. So what do I mean by discursive? It has to do with communication and information and discourse. So when I say that, this, when I talk about the status quo in America, I'm talking about some people that's controlling the way we talk about shit, the way we talk about things. I'm sorry I cuss a lot, y'all, but that's part of the street philosophy. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's what I mean. I'm talking about the people, and I'm gonna say it in a kind of philosophy language way, the people that control what we can say and how we can say it. The people that can control what we say so the content of, of, our, of, our, of, our, of, our, of our communication and how we can say it, the form. And I think this is very interesting because you, there's a lot of times in, in just social problems where people tell you all the time, I don't know, I don't have words for this. I don't have words for this, Darren, this racial, why I don't give me some words for this. What I think they're picking up on is this kind of controlling of, of discursive resources. And that's, some, that's kind of some of the power of phenomenology too. It's like well, the phenomenology is trying to give words to, to things that, that experience is just kind of, it's some gray areas. So we gonna, we'll come back to that. Okay, so the discursive power of the status quo is used to um, manage the information channels that unite um, a social arrangement. So a social arrangement for me is only connected by insofar as the as the as the members are exchanging information if we're not exchanging information we're not part we're not engaged socially and you know 
I want you to say, okay, information, what you mean? Talking? Well, it could be talking, but it also could be like, yo, what's up? Gestures. It could be, it could be all this other stuff that's communicating. But I'm not connecting to you socially unless we're communicating. So that's just a principle for me for social ontology. Okay. Um, and, and the communicate doesn't have to be perfect, by the way. It could be, I could be trying to, you know, speak my horrible uh, hosa. And y'all just be like, hold up, man. You trying to say something, but you ain't saying it right. I'm still trying to be part of the social arrangement, but you know, because I'm communicating, but it's it's just not proper. And I probably should never try to speak also, to be honest. But so that's 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 just that's just how I feel. So miscommunication doesn't mean um, non-communication. All right, so discursive power, and this I think this is this is the part I was talking about um a couple of slides ago with with um with this. We're gonna come back in QA. Um and it's it what I'm saying is this. So Discursive power, and I think this is a really powerful insight, is usually grounded. So grounding is a kind of metaphysical relation, you know, A and B, on some kind of material power. So this is the interesting part. It's like, okay, you Darren, you just said it was discursive power, but I'm like, yeah, but you know, the superstructure has some layers to it. So I'm not, I still kind of am Marxian about it. Like, yeah, most of the times, like, you know, even in the lunchroom, there's a, a material reason that made the cool people cool. They had the nice car, the clothes was nice. So there's these material or, you know, I, I am, I'm in the state, they look good, you know? That's that, you know, that's a raw material thing. So political, you know, whatever, they know the right people. I think that does matter to how the status quo is gonna set up its relation. So we can talk about that too. <laughs> Analysis of the, is continued. So what are the functions? Uh, of the status quo, what are the what, in what kind of purpose you know purpose driven way are they is it operating? So, for me, it design, designates discursive principles, dogmas, definitions, practices um, that become conventional. Notice I didn't say permanent. Conventions can change, but a convention is a convention because a conven all a convention is is some kind of regularity in, in a social arrangement. Something that happens over and over again and people accept it. Okay. So it, it also establishes formal institutions. I kind of didn't want to put the word formal because I think all institutions are formal, but I put there so we can we can you know chop back and forth about it. But right now it's like formal institutions that dictate what information is legible. I use the word legible precise for a lot of different philosophy of mind reasons. I do think, and we can talk about this later too, that there that even if you have a repress, but because you have repressive mechanisms, things that you know you don't have words for or whatever. There are just certain things, certain experiences that you're not going to read the right way. That you're not, not going to interpret the right way. Especially if you have this status quo, also white minded, you know, I use those interchangeably point of view on things. Okay, so what it, what it also appoints representatives to facilitate information to members of the social arrangement that are materially materially marginalized by the dominant speaker communities. Now this is, I think this is a Fanonian point. Fanon talks about this in Black Skin, White Mass. Um, and I think um, the rest of the earth too. Well, I can't remember exactly where he talks about it, but this is a very Fanonian point where he talks about, you know, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the settler comes, shit, the settler don't have to stay. Why the settler don't have to stay? Because the, the settler, by being there and indoctrinating the, the native, now he's then pulled some of the natives on to the side of the colonial, he calls it the colonial psyche. So now these representatives that they have the colonial psyche, the, the, the settler can go back to France. <laughs> they don't have to be there no more. They can go back to the UK. They can go back to the suburbs. If you're an American, when you think about internal colonization like Stoke and Carmichael, they don't have to be there. And that's, that's the appointing, the baptizing that goes on, right? So what am I doing here? This is, I think, and I think the history of philosophy is the most important part of this. What I think I'm doing here is identifying another kind of power relation that we have in the human condition. Hegel talked about the master and the slave relation. Marx talked about the capitalist and the work or the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. But no one talked about the settler and native. Pollock, Darian is going to talk about the status quo in the streets. Now, this is the kicker. 
and I'm not trying to praise myself or anything, but I do think this is a discovery in philosophy. And I, and I really get met, pissed off when people think that philosophy can't have discoveries. I think that's a really bad way to think about research and philosophy. No, ro- philosophy has research programs, y'all. It has research programs, and we, we're steadily making progress and deep progress. That's what, you know, it's, it's the same kind of research that goes on in science. Um, so what am I saying here? I think that what I really want to say about this is that the status quo streets relation is the umbrella thing that every other power relation falls under. That is a very strong and controversial claim, but I'm standing by it. And I want people to push back because I'm defending the hell out myself on that. I think, yes, I think the status quo streets, I think that the, so let me start. I think the master slave capitalist worker, whatever, settler native, black, white, man, nature, whatever you want, can all be folded under the status quo streets relation. So that's what I mean by thinking, uh, to identify uh, a power relation in the human condition. Something that we, it's never going away, it's part of it. Um, oh, I do wanna say, and it's interesting because this, these two things are dependent on some kind of structure domination, capitalism, colonialism. I don't, I don't really know what to think about, maybe class, whatever. I, I, so I see those are all kind of like temporary. I don't see this as the same as this. I think this is permanent, a part of human condition. Okay, so this is the this is I mean, this is a very important diagram. I need like a, some computer science friends or something to help me have a better diagram. Of this, but this, I, I this is the best I can do, y'all. Um, so this is how I'm thinking about the status quo and the, as the center. Really, kind of I like it more vertically, kind of like vertical thing. And then you have these what I call hidden scripts. So these dominant scripts are coming from the status quo, and then these these other kind of scripts at the margin, which you may call a hidden script, um, that are are kind of having its own thing going on, but also kind of in touch with the information that's going on in the status quo. And what's, what's uniting these, these things are, are, are the topic. So you're gonna have a status quo for any particular topic. That's why it can be so fine grained on the level of discourse, okay? Oh, shoot. So what, so I use this technical term hidden scripts, but I gotta give a definition to it, right? Because I, you know, we slowly get into, you know, what we're doing is just giving this analysis of, of the street aspect of this knowledge part. So the hidden scripts I define as the communicative resources that marginalized groups use to facilitate information about a particular topic. So remember, what unites these hidden scripts, what 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 makes this one social arrangement is that all the content that is, is packaged within the hidden scripts or the dominant scripts, the status quo, all are gonna be about the same thing. So I use an example all the time um, about hip hop music. You know, a lot of people, if they just have like this kind of general status quo ideology, they say, okay, hip hop music is always, you know, if they accept what I, what my language, it's always gonna be at the margins there. It's always gonna be at the streets. I'm like, no, you can't look at it like that because for whatever, t- anytime you have a social arrangement pop up, even something that started off at the margins, hip hop started off at the margins within American music society, that doesn't mean it can't evolve. Things change every day. And that's the whole thing about contestation. So even, so my claim is even hip hop has a status quo and margins on it that's competing to get more within the status quo or defeat the status quo. You can do this for any topic. That's why I keep it at the level of discourse because it's topical. And that's why it's discursive. And that's how you get the more fine grained explanation that you want at the social level. I want clarity, y'all. I don't, I don't want to walk around confused. I don't want to just, um, uh, uh, just sound like I'm saying something. I want to actually be t- referring to something that's a part of the world, okay? So what's examples of hidden scripts? And this was, this is the interesting stuff. This is, a so, this is the most social, this is where the social scientists can help us out, the linguists and all that. So just a, a short list. I think, you know, non-conventional, verbal expression. So in America, we call that slang, you know? So when I um, talk, you know, when I talk to my, my community back home in North Florida and we talk about, um, and we use certain ways of communicating. Oh shoot, I'm sorry. Uh, hold on, I got to change. Well, wow. so sorry. Just I have to move this because I can't see my slide. Um, So when I go back home to North Florida and we talk in our way, or I go to, I was just in Jamaica and when they talk in the, in the, in the, in the patois, um, this kind of way of communicating 
it's not the Queen's English. It's not, you know, I can't, you know, can't necessarily get in front of a, a, a public audience and talk this way, right? Um, what's interesting though, is also, I mean, like I said, it's always gonna be a status quo. I, I was just in Jamaica and I think it's an interesting story. In Jamaica, you know, so when you're in America or other places and you hear somebody speak Patois, you're like, wow, I can't understand what they're saying. That's so to the margins, right? But in Jamaica, it gets even more fine grained. Some people, you know, you talk to uh, Jamaicans in the urban city, they say, they say, oh, well, we speak more proper than people in the bush or people in, in, the, in the country. Their patois is totally different from ours. So you can see how this thing, Jamaican patois, which is already seen like at the margins of the English language, itself has a status quo. This is a, a point that I think a lot of people in linguistics and social philosophy language miss. Because you want, you want this, you want Florida slang, you want the slang that's coming out of New York or whatever to be at the margins because look, they don't talk this way. But to be very uh, 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 um, uh, uh, exhaustive, you have to go inside that social arrangement and see what, what kind of power relations is popping up. So I think that's interesting, right? Um, so non-conventional speech acts, speech acts could be, you know, just things that, you know, uh, more so things that you're doing with language. Like, you know, like when a person gets married, like you, you say the vow. So, so different kinds of, um, I hate to say, I'm gonna use this example, but it, this is just an example. Like uh, you, if you meet, I've, I've done a lot of work, felt registered fellows to vote in Florida, gang members and stuff. There's a lot, they have a lot of um, handshakes and speech that mean something. Like you're making a deal when you, when you, when you walk that way or you, you do this sign like this, okay. Or, or you say it like this, speech act. Communicator gestures, that's kind of the same bucket, you know, whatever. Um, shared narratives, stories that we tell to, you know, explain things. Signaling, cultural devices, and I think it's a big one. You know, you do a whole dissertation on this, music, food, dance. Um, I, we, got a, we got special ways we dance in North Florida. Can't really dance that way in Boston. They don't even have the music for it. Boston is a very white space, y'all. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So, so this, this, so this, this is the the meta philosophy stuff. So, me, philosophers always want to talk about form and content. So I guess you could ask the question, same thing about the hidden scripts. Um, what's the form of content of scripts? So how you want to, you know, ask the question? How is the information that is supplied by the hidden scripts facilitated? Okay. So I got three claims with this. The first claim is this: hidden scripts are formed by oral culture, okay? That is to say that I think that what I'm saying is that, um, so let me just go through the points. This is, this is not to say um, that it's not possible to document information. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that from when it starts off, it starts off non, um, non-written, uh, what it, what's the word for that? Um, uh, I guess I gotta use the word non-written, non-written, non-formalized, non-institutional. That's where it starts. I'm not saying it can't become. Actually, to be honest, to be able to even engage with the status quo, you might think it nice. It has to get some kind of formalization, some some kind of institutionalization. But but what I'm saying is, it doesn't start off by that way. So it's formed by our oral culture. Um, and like and so the, another point I think is important is like the documentation thing. The re, um, we use these metaphors in analytic philosophy where it's like upstream. It's like what, what's going on at that at that time, you know, at that time it's being created. Downstream is the stuff that goes on later, you know, at this creation, after the origin. And so what I'm saying is I think the documentation is downstream from the original creation of, of the information. Okay. So we can talk about this, but I think that's that's where I'm going with now. Claim two, the kind of information hidden scripts facilitate is experiential knowledge. So if you think about knowledge in different ways, you can have knowledge um uh like I said, you can have scientific knowledge, you can have this and that, you know, testimony knowledge, whatever. I think it's experiential knowledge. But what is experiential knowledge? Um, this is another thing people talk about a lot of times with critical theory, black studies. I'm like, what? Okay, you're using the word, but what are you saying with it? What are you referring to? Are you just trying to make white people mad? I'm not trying to just make white people. I'm trying to do that too, but I'm not trying to just do that. <laughs> so boom. So this experiential knowledge need not be firsthand for any particular speaker. That sounds counterintuitive, but this is what I mean by this is what I mean by this. Within the, within the margins, within uh, the street communities, 
you can have somebody that has an experience, right? That's firsthand. And you can have that experience that is structured because of certain material factors, or whatever, that somebody else can possibly have too, but they may not have had it yet. So you see, so you see what I'm saying? So it's possible for this person to have the not have that experience, but they in fact haven't because of whatever reason. They just haven't got there yet. What I'm saying is this: that person who hasn't had that experience can still get the knowledge through testimony. Okay, and that's what goes on all the time. Um, whatever, I mean, however you want to make it, you know, gender cases, race cases, where, hold up, I didn't know that, you know, I remember the first time, you know, I really learned about profiling, like for real. I'm like, I didn't really know about that, but then when somebody told me about it, I'm like, oh, that's what was happening to me? Whoa, okay, that's what it is. So it's like, you know, that kind of testimony is giving me this kind of, access to my experiential knowledge. Again, so what makes this knowledge experiential is the fact that it derives from human interaction with the external world and is not mediated by institutional resources. That conjunction is very important here. You can't have when you, these things go together. It has to be inner human action and not mediated. And, but I'm not counting testimony as mediation. I'm talking about institutional mediation. Claim three. Part, I should have italicized part here, part of what makes these scripts hidden, because that's a metaphor itself, is their form, orality, and their content, lived experience. So I'm trying to give a reason why I'm calling it hidden scripts. It's because like the orality of it, the fact, the fact it's going on without this, this institution mediation, and the fact that it is about these personalized interactions with the world, um, that is why it's hidden part of the reason the second part is because it's inspired by the fact that from the standpoint okay let's go back from this standpoint this they say that these things have standpoint from this standpoint the experiential knowledge is illegitimate so it's not true, authentic, whatever, and illegible. So this explains why when you have people who are very status quo on whatever topic it is, and they get presented new information, that person means like, that doesn't make sense. That's obscure, that's distorted. It's not legible because it wasn't allowed to be. So the repression goes along with the distortion. Uh, Darren, okay, thank you. I was just was just about to say that uh, we should be wrapping up. Okay, cool. Can I, can I run through this real quick? Or? Yeah, sure. That's fine. So the closing mark. So the purpose of street knowledge, three purposes, is to challenge and change what counts as a dominant script in a social arrangement. So whatever topic it is. An account of street knowledge can help social theories gain a better understanding of what we mean when we use terms like popular culture and mainstream discourse. I think that those words, we use them too much. We don't know what the hell they mean and social reform and revolution. So reform and revolution, whether you're a reformist or revolution about a particular topic, it's always, so this is a strong claim, gonna be motivated by, by the street knowledge that gets incorporated into the dominant, dominant scripts that constitute the status quo. So thank you, um, and I'm looking forward to the questions. All right, uh, thank you so much, Darren, uh, for a very interesting talk. And I think that you've really given us a great conceptualization of what you mean by uh, street knowledge. Uh, I think that I'm going to ask uh, some of the people in the room to start by asking questions, then I might pose my own questions as time goes, uh, in case uh, they, if there is still time for me to pose questions. Um, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? If you would, please uh, do indicate by raising your hand. <coughs> uh, uh, any questions from the room? Okay, we have uh, Wang Gui from Huma. Uh, would you kindly uh, unmute yourself and ask a question? Thank you. Uh, thank you. One second. So thank you so much, Diane. I really 
I'm partially asking this very ill-formed question uh, just because I really appreciated your talk and your honesty and, and your commitment. So my question is, is there, I know you've completely, uh, you've been trying to distinguish very fervently uh, to deracialize the streets, which is really important and really something you need to flag all the time. But my question is, is there, uh, and I don't know if it's clear, what are the stakes for street knowledge? What are the stakes, uh, what is at stake when in your assertion that it is a science, that it's knowledge, that it's valued? What, what are the stakes? I don't know if that's clear to you. Or are there, are there any stakes for a particular demographic? What are the stakes you feel that you're grappling with? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, here's, here's the main stake. When you interpret the streets and street and the resources of the streets, the street knowledge, as in in an associative way of just the ghetto mentality, and you and it gets baptized in all this deviant stuff, and which is, is a part of it too. I'm not going to not. That's why I'm gonna go back to that. This is what happens when you just when you make it so that you can't talk about the positive aspects of change, what we call in our ordinary language activism. To be an activist, you have to have street knowledge. You have to be engaged with communities at the margins. And, and it, it doesn't matter what your activists are about. That's why I just talk, make it topical. So my thing, my main thing, just to kind of just be straightforward, is like I, I you know, I, I consider myself a scholar activist and the Street Philosophy Institute, we do scholar activism. And part of my thing about that was like trying to um under uh, trying to get people to understand like, hey, look, some of some of your main uh actor, you know best activist actors are going to be people that you think are just totally deviant. And I'm thinking about the gangsters, the thugs, the drug dealers. If you can pull that aspect of the, you know, if you can pull that ghetto mentality aspect from those people, then you can have the revolutionary potential that you want. And last thing, I want to get kind of historical on this because Marx, he talks about the love and proletariat. He talks about these, these, this group, so this, this, track, this structure of people that's underneath the proletariat that are just totally dysfunctional, totally. Du Bois has a similar idea in the Philadelphia Negro. He calls them the submerged tent. Then they can't do nothing. They're pulling the black people down. I think both of these theorists are white-minded in this point because they had this associative thing with the streets. They didn't understand that if you could kind of refashion this shit, you can get them back right. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, unless you have a question for Mirren. Hey, great talk, man. Great talk. Thank you. I really did find myself uh, agreeing with you, man. It was a really uh, ambitious claim, especially when you start talking about research programs and, you know, the importance of, you know, kind of going forward with our claims. Man. I really appreciate that. Uh, appreciate I got, yeah, like two big, big picture claim or big picture question. So the first one, uh, it was more about the relationship you see between how you look at street knowledge and the uh, the work of like black sociologists like Du Bois today, you know, kind of like those, uh, you know, like the social dominance theorists out there, even the intersectional invisibility theorists uh, and that whole tradition, of, you know, going back to those people who, uh, like Carmichael, who used like uh, internal colonial theory and stuff like that. And the second quick question was, I wanted your account of the development of Black studies and it's, you know, kind of interface with critical theory because in the United States, it is something that unfortunately we're dealing with right now. Um, black studies in its original conception is not necessarily what it still is today. So that was the two questions I had. Thank, thank you for letting me ask. No problem. Um, so look, so I, I just had this debate with, with uh, uh, a grad student in the government department, a black woman. Um, well, I'm gonna say mixed women, woman. I think that matters, a mixed woman, because we in America, so. Um, who, yeah, so we, talk, we talked about the whole concept of the vanguard that you get, that you see in Marx and Lenin. And just the whole idea of, of does the, the streets, does the proletariat, does the workers, does the people at the bottom, do they need leading? Um, and the reason why I think it dovetails nicely with this question is because I said, yeah, 
And it's ironic because it's like I'm I'm going with the streets. You're like, what do you mean? And this is why I, this is why I brought up that material aspect. So this is what I think. So to ask your question, the there has to be a role for the the, the theoretical frameworks and the you know that, that that are being development the, the, the being developed in scholarship in certain black studies programs, but not just black studies, sociology. You know, there's, there's good what I'm trying to say. There's good scholarship that liberates us out there, right? Why do you need that? Because part of the, you know, I don't even like this word false conscience. I'd rather use white minded or ghetto mentality. Part of the white minded or ghetto mentality thing that keeps the street, some of the street players, active, actors, activists, counter revolutionary is the fact that they, they, they don't have access to the right concepts and words and language to peel back some of the dysfunctional shit. And so, yeah, you need, you gotta have, so I, I'm, I'm with the intellectuals. Like I, you need black intellectuals. I wouldn't be an intellectual with, without engaging with black intellectuals. So you need us. But at the same time, this is gonna dovetail to your next question. The state of black studies, bourgeois. I'm gonna show you some, I don't know if y'all can see this, but I'm, this, I got a picture of Marcus Garvey right there hanging up. I look at it every morning and I kiss it. That's my favorite, you know what I'm saying? I love Mark, you know, I love him. I had a I had a cat right who went to Atlanta Public Schools. It's my it's my it's my homie, and he walked into my house, and he said, "Darren, is that your uncle?" I said, "Bro, that's Mark. That's the Honorable Marcus Garvey." Why am I telling this story? Even something as 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 as, as something we take for granted because we're intellectuals, like everybody know. What it's so detached from the black communities. So that's just an example of, about all black studies right now. And, and a lot of black, a lot of my mentors may even kick me, kick me on this, but I do believe, and I think we have to correct it and, unless we're gonna go down the same path. We, black studies has to become more wedded to an ordinary language philosophy, to a more street knowledge. So we can talk about the stuff that we find in Marx, find in Fanon, find in Du Bois with people who need to know about it. Cause I can't, I can't take this pro proletarian language and talk to it about people with who barely got a third. You know, I ain't trying to talk about some of my home, but some of them are just they're undereducated in that formal sense. So black studies, we have to get off our ASSES or whatever, and and really start brainstorming about the pedagogy of teaching black studies. And that's and, a and, 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 and unlike the '60s, the federal government is giving them financial literacy books. <laughs> Right, right, right. And not reading George Jackson anymore. They read in, uh, you know, financial literacy. They're coming right. out trying to start businesses now. So, yeah. Thank you for answering my question. No problem. Man. Yeah. Well, we got a lot to talk about too, man. For real. Uh, next question we have from uh, Sanya. Then we can uh, go to Babaka. Sanya, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Lerato. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> your talk is so intriguing because it, it destroyed all my presuppositions about how or your take. I think you've done philosophy a very good um, turn by, you know, sticking to the language and discourse and format of philosophy. But I, I think you also run into the limits of philosophy because we are also expecting some sort of sociological or stroke anthropological analysis of, of this phenomenon called street culture. Um, because I, and the first I mean, you did see, um, do something to quite what what I found most intriguing was that to say you're not discussing about marginalized communities, um, or, you know, gangsters, what have you, um, developing communities, third world communities. You you said no, no, that's not exactly what you're interested in, but you were interested in developing concepts. And these concepts are very useful for philosophy, but um, I think we also need some sort of anthropological picture or presentation of the phenomenon. You, you know, so I think that is what, how do you hope to transcend the limits of philosophical discourse in presenting something perhaps that philosophy is not particularly equipped to handle. So that's that's my question. I think you need you need to transcend the strictures of philosophy to deal with this very interesting phenomenon. Or do you agree? Or don't I, you? I, thank you, Sonny. That's that uh that's definitely something on my mind. And this is how I approach it. So 
and I, I just want to dovetail on what Myron was, what I was saying with Myron too. Look, now this is a bold claim, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I think the only purpose of philosophy is to set up research programs, period. Set the principles for them. That's it, that's all we gotta do. We, we set the principles for research programs. After that, everything becomes empirical. So what do I think about street, this, this street philosophy? I think street philosophy itself is a research program that scientists, social scientists especially, have to start adhering to. And what does street philosophy offer them? Better language, better concepts, better categories, better frames, better metrics that gets beyond the bullshit. And that's it. I, I think it's once the philosopher, you know, be honest with you, man, after, you know, after I really write the books about street philosophy, I'm, I'm probably going to go do art or something. I might, be, you know, become a, you know, a rapper or some shit like that, because after that, philosophy is over for me. Philosophy has to set up the research programs. But that's so look, I, I say that, but that's hard work, y'all. It could take me 30 years to get the, the, get the concept straight. And so I think but that's what I really think. I think that to your point, like the empirical analysis is going to come in after you get the program set up in the right way. I hope, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Um, just before we continue, uh, I'd just like to let everyone know that we might go over time by about 10 minutes. So uh, if you do want to stay, you're more than welcome. Um, just uh, next question comes from Babaka and then I'll ask my own questions afterwards. Um, thank you so much, Darren, for this wonderful and fascinating talk. Um, while you were speaking, um, the, the concept of street intellectual keeps popping up in my mind because, you know, and um, because myself, I'm really much, um, I'm very much interested in, um, you know, hip hop and the power of hip hop uh, to decolonize, you know, the modern university. So my question is very quickly, uh, to what extent do you think hip hop is hip hop can legitimate, you know, street knowledge, street intellectuals um, within the very walls of, of academia, for example. Thank you. So I'm, 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 I teach a class on, on, on hip hop and social movements for Harvard Summer School. I just taught one and I'm teaching one at Morehouse um, next semester. So I'm me, me and you on the same page, brother. Now this is the problem though, <clears throat> fetishism. Mainstreamism. Uh, there's a, a, a great scholar by the name of Amani Perry who wrote a book called Prophets of the Hood. Prophets of the Hood. You should really check that book out, especially check on Outlaws. Um, she told me, a, and I'm gonna be quick. She told me a story about say, hey, look, dear, you your generation don't understand. Like when hip hop first came out, especially in, you know in America, you know whatever, you could not access it on the radio. It was totally marginal. And, I, and, and you see similar things, you know, I, I'm interested in a lot of Latin, um, Afro-Latino communities. You know, they, they use, they're using hip hop, Afro-Latino hip hop to kind of re rebel against some of the, the racial shit that they got going on. And so, but what I'm saying is this, look, at least, so this is gonna be kind of American centric, but within America, now I'm teaching a class of all white kids and they know more about the mainstream hip hop than me. Why is that? What happened? What happened? Did hip hop lose some of its revolutionary potential? Did it, this, so th this is what I'm gonna say. I don't think it lost its revolutionary potential, but I do think that we're dealing with a different phenomenon now. Hip hop is mainstream. So mainstream hip hop is different from non-mainstream hip hop. And I don't think hip, um, I don't think hip hop as a topic will ever go non-mainstream again. So we got, we, as hip hop theorists, we have to deal with that. So that's, I mean, that's, we could talk more sure. about it. I know we got time. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, sure. Let's, let's email, let's email, do email. Yes, it's a, we will email for sure. I will email. Thank you so much. Could you, can you please share email in the chat so that we can? Yes, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Baba. Um, no, I just, uh, from my side, I have a couple of uh, questions. I guess I'd call them conceptual questions. And they come from uh, some of the examples that you used to further elucidate your concept um, or the concept of uh, street knowledge. Um, and you basically said how, I mean, using the example of a lunchroom, for example, that there's of course a status quo, and then there's the hidden script behind it. But then within the people with that hidden script, there might also be uh, a, a, a sort of status quo that the hidden script does not necessarily account for. So I'm wondering, uh, I guess my question comes from the angle of a 
almost like a Hegelian kind of thinking around how uh, people or, or these groups are, that you are assigning, you are assigning street knowledge to, uh, can necessarily somewhat uh, embody some sort of contradiction in themselves uh, in terms of uh, a contradiction in their epistemology, because it seems that um, while they are in some sense, you know, individuals who would be considered uh, subordinate to some status quo, they do themselves present a status quo within their community that perhaps sub subordinates others. Um, so I'm wondering how you work that into your conception. But I'm also wondering whether uh, you, you think of this, uh, do you think of uh, street knowledge within the broader schema of the, of the, I guess, the discursive power relation that you spoke about? Do you think of street knowledge as something, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm more interested in looking at the, the, higher, the, the relationship that you're creating between uh, street knowledge and the status quo knowledge as I, as I think I'd understand. Uh, and whether um, the, the, say, uh, the street knowledge of community C will always, community C will always be uh, in subordinate relation to uh, mm. the status quo, right? Um, so it's I'm just kind of like wanting to really entertain these these tensions that come about because um, it it seems like they, there has to be an allowance in the conception of street knowledge to say that street knowledge can become status quo, right? Uh, and kind of work that into the concept into the concept of, of street knowledge as well, but also kind of teasing out that, that uh, tension of like, well, if it can become status quo, then uh, how then do we still kind of understand it as a form of, no form of knowledge that is subordinate in the structure of uh, what you call this uh, status quo versus uh, hidden kind of scripts. So I guess that's, that's my uh, question that's been uh, gnawing at me, yeah. Great question, man. Um, I put in this chat. I'm being funny. I'm. I love comedy, y'all. I, I really love comedy. I should have put that as one of the resources. Comedy is like the best thing. Um, but this is not actually comedy. This is actually a real philosophy quote from Nietzsche. Y'all you know, probably familiar with it. Nietzsche says, I, "Uh, don't fight the monster lest you become it." And I, I love that quote. I think it's one of the best social ontological quote there is. And to dovetail it on your point, I think that yeah, look. <laughs> Part of the problem with getting people at the margins or the, or the groups at the margins to contest and to, and to fight the status quo is that it ends up barring some of the resources from the status quo to fight it, right? Um, this is what I was trying to say, get to at when I say, well, in order to fight the status quo, you kind of have to institutionalize. So that's why I made room for it becoming documented downstream. So it, you do get that, you know, you get, I mean, hip hop is a great an example. Like you yeah. get that way. It, now it's taking on some of the pop, you know, and now you're like, wow, is it still? And so that's just, that's a feature. I don't, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's a feature. Mm. And that's, that's a part of the Hegelian dialectic stroke, you know, boom, boom, boom. Um, this is the thing. So now we, we really got to do ontology. We got to do the law of identity. We're really the logic. You know, yeah. A is different from A prime. It may appear like A, A prime may look like A, but A prime is not A. So just from a strict logical perspective, when that A becomes A prime by fighting that, you know, fighting that B, so it did change B from B and B, you know, so now, so, so you got three players, you got A, well, you got two players at first, so A and B, so B is the status quo, A is the one that's fighting, a is trying to change the status quo, so it does a little bit to change B, and it did change B. But guess what? B ain't there no more, but A ain't A no more. A is A prime. So that's how I look at it, where it's like it's just not the same thing once it gets out the march. Second question, the subordination. I think logic really helps us on that one. On the subordination thing, this – so within social theory and social ontology, it has just as much problem as black studies. People don't talk about the public in the right way. You have a lot of people who talk about – and I, I wrote a paper on this – who talk about counterpublics. The reason why I don't talk about counterpublics is because it has this connotation of a subordination, of, of perpetual subordination. And I don't think, you know, black people, you know, black culture has, you know, been subordinate, whatever, but I don't think you can say it's subordinate now. 
in America. It, it drives the shit. It's definitely part. Black culture is definitely part of the status quo now. It's not the same black culture to Myron's point, but it's driving it. It's, it's, it's a prime. And so that's the kind of thing that I think that we have to, the streets gives you that malleability where you don't have to stick something as a counterculture towards the mainstream culture. No, things change and they will change. So. Thank you for that. Um, are there any final questions that anyone has um, to pose to Darren? Uh, I guess uh, one other question that I had maybe ties a bit into what Sanya asked, and then afterwards you can just close the, the session. Because um, I think that uh, with uh, conceptual engineering, it's quite interesting because um, I guess we, we can obviously conceptual engineer in, a, in multiple ways. And uh, as analytical philosophers, I'm sure you, you know that uh, people really love the uh, reflective equilibrium method, for example. Right, because it somewhat allows us to uh, incorporate, uh, I guess, the the intuitions that are out there, and I, I guess even allows for some room to really incorporate the, I guess, the 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 phenomena that we the phenomena that we are trying to take out the concept from. So I'm wondering, like, if you uh, in 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 developing the concept of the street, as you said, you spoke about suspending it, and I think that. Uh, it, to me, uh, it, it seems like the suspension is really difficult to do. And I think maybe I'm coming from it as a phenomenologist of some sort. The suspension of, of a concept can be very difficult to do because it seems that even in, in kind of articulating the concept to us, we can't help but uh, re kind of remove that sticky relation that it has with the context that we, uh, what you call this, uh, relate those concepts to, right? So in the sense that you were saying that, yeah, don't associate it with the ghetto, don't associate it with criminal criminality or whatever the case may be. And that might have good, uh, it might have good political motive, right? And it might have, it might have good, uh, uh, what you call this, uh, uh, I guess, uh, transformational uh, components, but on a phenomenological level as well, when you're trying to explain the, the, the phenomenon as it is, right? It seems like it becomes very difficult to then separate it from, from those kind of spaces because that is where uh, these, these concepts um, most of us would understand to be uh, coming from, right? Yeah. That they, they, in a sense, like uh, can't be separated from their context. So I'm wondering like, if you, if you think about this tension and what, uh, I guess it, it speaks again to the limits of, uh, of analytical philosophy. And I'm an analytical philosopher myself, and I try to really make it and put it in conversation with uh, continental philosophy. And one of the limits of it is that it turns to uh, decontextualize to a point where um, the context really in doing it, there's, there's a sense in which decontextualization um, can do some harm to the the concept itself that has been trying to uh, uh, that you that you might be trying to uh, ex uh, bring about or kind of explain. So I'm wondering, like, if your thoughts on that kind of I think I'm just trying to push you a bit further into uh, articulating the importance of suspending the streets, right? Given these kind of uh, issues that might come about as a result of of taking that analytical move. Yeah, I mean. Obviously, it's going to be really hard for, for us because we so, you know, damaged the media. Really, this is for the kids. It's for the youth. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, I think, I think it all starts with, like, the topology of, like, what we, what we think is primitive. So for me, how I would teach is, like, you know, the streets is a primitive thing that we use, a, a term we use, but also the ghetto is, too. And I think mm -hmm. that what, what you want to do is, like, you don't have to totally decontextualize because you just say, hey, everything that you think applies to the streets actually applies to the ghetto. And, and that, that's the confusion. And another point is just about cases where it's like, you start calling out contradictions for people. That's the best way to learn. It's like, okay, you talk about gangster being in a certain context, but in what true practical difference, difference in practice is the street gangster any different from the Wall Street gangster? Mm. One wears a suit, one doesn't. Okay, well, those are superficial qualities. Mm. But I'm talking about the practices. So you can, so if you can take gangster or ghetto and or whatever, however you want to think about it, those properties that fall under ghetto and you can apply it to a different context mm. that you wouldn't normally mediaize do, you can do the same thing with the streets. You can make the streets be something more like 
you know, really there's a talk that I want to give about what I call the street disposition. So the streets for me at, at the basic level is going to be dispositional. So it's going to be, it's not going to be tied to any space anyway. So this is how you can get, and I, I, I met so many rich people at Harvard who have a street disposition. They grew up in the freaking suburbs, but those people, they some of the best, and that's what, why they're such good lawyers and negotiators and shit like that, because they have a street disposition. So really, I, I didn't get a chance to kind of flesh it out, but really, in order to answer your question, I have to like explain more about what I mean by the street disposition. Mm. I think that really helps. And I, I mean, again, I just thought about how you even articulated the difference between content and form for, for uh, individuals who are not uh, part of, like, philo like primarily philosophers. And I think that could also help a lot in kind of clarifying the need to kind of, you know, remove it out of these presuppositions that we have about what, where street knowledge belongs and what street knowledge is and the fact that it can't be found in different spaces, even the spaces uh, of, of the status quo, as you'd say, because it yeah. seems like in just what you just said, uh, yeah. the uh, people in the suburbs and the status quo who embody some sort of uh, street knowledge. But um, yeah, I feel that I, uh, that's all I have to say on this, but um, we definitely hit, uh, half, I think it's 10 past five here in South Africa. Um, so we're going to conclude the talk. So thank you so much, Darian. Thank uh, you. And yeah, thank, thank you all for joining us as well. Uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. South African time, we will have the Humor Interdisciplinary Series Seminar, where Zaudin Sadar of the University of London will present a talk titled Introduction to Post-Normal Times. So thank you all again and looking forward to welcoming you back in the next sessions. Thanks so much. Thank you.